Let me start off by saying I know how terribly dumb and naive I was for letting myself get into this situation. Hell, sometimes I even laugh at how preposterous this whole thing was, and you can too. It is kind of funny at parts. However, at the same time, I knew if I had been just a little dumber, I might have not been so lucky. And no, I do not have a foot fetish myself. It all started a couple of years ago. I was a sophomore in high school, 15 or 16 at the time, and I was hanging out with an extremely toxic and emotionally manipulative acquaintance, Holly, who, let's just say, wasn't shy about getting money from lucrative ways. Such ways included scamming older men for their money from fake dating profiles she made of other girls in our grade she didn't like, stealing from her parents, and bumming off money and things from her other friends. She had been doing this for years, same age as Carter and I, and was a minor at the time. Sure, we could have been considered friends, but I was much closer to my best friend Carter. Carter had been best friends with Holly since freshman year, and honestly, the only reason I hung out with her was because Carter insisted on inviting her to her hangouts every time. Holly was not a good person, and I quietly put up with her antics. One day, she starts talking about her friend Sarah. Awesome, but honestly, I really didn't care, especially knowing Carter and her ditched me for her. I wasn't really paying attention to the story until Holly asked me if I wanted to sell my socks for money. What the fuck? She smiles and proceeds to tell me how they found a super senior, kid you not, who bought knee-high socks for $90. All Sarah did was have to wear them outside for an entire day. Yeah, the freak liked them sweaty, I guess. The only thing was, the super senior insisted on meeting in person only. Holly laughed, telling me it was a little weird. Okay, red flag number one. Holly never really thought things were weird unless they were really fucking weird. Then, she proceeds to tell me that this super senior, honestly, I never got his name, so I'll just call him Kyle, was trying to get her in his house the entire time, but finally gave up and they left. You're probably thinking, what the hell? Who would be dumb enough to try and wrangle money from this freak? Me. I'm an idiot. All I really heard was $90 for a pair of old worn socks. I was in. Being the amazing friends they were, Holly and Carter just laughed and informed me that I would have to do it on my own since they had better things to do. Whatever that meant. They gave me his Instagram handle and wished me luck. Well, we had a problem right off the bat. You see, I had totaled my car just around a month before and I had no vehicle of my own. American and small town, so it was hard to get around without a car. Well, being the dumbass that I was, and still am, I decided, hey, let's just take my mom's car. Huge mistake. So I start messaging this Kyle on Instagram, explaining my situation and how I got in contact with him. I can't remember most of the conversation, but I can remember the guy being really insistent on meeting at his apartment complex. Red flag number two. Although I am very stupid and naive at times, I had at least had common sense. I brushed it off and suggested other local areas, Starbucks parking lot, local park, etc., but this guy wasn't backing down. Finally, after much convincing, I get Kyle to agree to meet in a nearby park, right by his house. Red flag number three. So I convince my mom to allow me to drive her car, and I meet up with Kyle at the park. It's mostly deserted, but it's a busy street, so I don't feel too uncomfortable. That's when I met Kyle. He was a huge, fat, sweaty guy with a beard that reeked to high hell. Think neck beard. The guy was at least 19, but looked like he could be pushing mid-20s. That's when I knew I had made a mistake, but there was no way I was going to say no to $90. I awkwardly greeted him and formal pleasantries were exchanged. I didn't remember much of the weird-ass conversation other than a couple of highlights. Number one, the dude brought fucking rope. Turns out he was into bounding feet as well, and I was super creeped out. Dude then starts to tie my feet together after I mumbled a weak agreement. All I remember is staring at the sun wishing I could die right there and then. Number two, this guy had the gall to call my feet ugly while rubbing and massaging them. That kind of hurt, not gonna lie. Number three, dude was insistent, 
almost straight up begging on showing me his knife collection back at home, and he would pay me extra to come with him. Yeah, no, wasn't going to happen. I knew what that meant, and my virgin ass wanted no part in that. Highlights continued. Number four, dude straight up sniffed my socks after I gave them to him. No shame whatsoever. Told me he liked the vinegar smell. Yeah, turns out the socks used to belong to my deceased grandfather. I just grabbed a random knee-high pair from my sock drawer. Number five, after refusing Kyle multiple times to come back to his house, he only gave me one-third of the price we agreed on since I refused to come home with him. Whatever. I was disgusted and disturbed a high hell anyways and wanted to get the fuck out of there. After returning home and getting my ass chewed out by my mom, I told her the truth after she asked me why I took her car, and I promptly blocked the guy and called my friends to tell them about the experience. Much to my surprise, Holly informed me about something she forgot to tell me about. Apparently, the guy had made several threats of shooting up his high school's graduation and very well known to the local police. Although I thought this was over and done with my junior year of high school, I received threatening and grotesque phone calls in which I reported to the police. Carter and Holly were also called and threatened. While mine was more of a sexual nature, theirs involved being called extremely specific slurs. Holly was black and Carter was gay. And he even recited Holly's address. Although I never found out who did them, and there was a good chance Holly could have orchestrated the whole thing herself. I can't help but wonder if Kyle was behind them. So to the foot fetish guy who tried to get a miner to come back to his apartment and look at his knife collection, let's not meet ever again. July 2017, four teenagers went missing in New Hope, Pennsylvania. I worked the overnight shift at a Wawa in the area, and from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we get all types normal obnoxious drunks, cops, and the occasional construction worker or gardener in for their morning coffee. So when yet another customer came in covered in dirt, I figured he was just another hard-working man in a blue-collar job. He had been in before, so we made small talk and he went on his way. That was Friday. I didn't see him on Saturday, but then Sunday, he was in again. He got food and a drink and after the normal hi, how are you, he went on his way again. Monday comes and I'm working like normal, when a few cops come in for coffee, and you can tell something's wrong. We got a lead on those missing teens, they said solemnly. We're searching a farm down the road. All of our hearts sank. It had been days since they went missing, so they were slowly losing hope, but this confirmed our worst suspicions. The cops were out there all night, stopping in occasionally to update us whether or not they were actually supposed to. They brought in dogs and eventually found them. 12 feet down and covered in concrete. It was bad. At the scene, they could only identify two of the teens based on their clothing, but there were enough bones to imply that all four were down there. Everyone was devastated. Then, the cops asked for our security tapes. Why? We asked, confused. We haven't had anyone suspicious. It was then that they revealed that the killer, a guy named Cosmo DiNardo, had in fact been in our store Friday night and again on Sunday. His cousin actually helped him kill, but he wasn't in the store. The dirt-covered man was a murderer. I was floored, and when I left work, I looked up a picture of the man they arrested. It was him. He was covered in dirt because he had just buried the bodies, and I had made small talk and wished him a good day. Part 2 I've struggled with mental issues for most of my life and have ended up in mental hospitals because of it a couple times now. While there, I made a couple of good friends and we would tell each other stories and random things about us. One of my friends had briefly been in jail with Cosmo DiNardo. Apparently, even though he seemed completely normal when I met him, he has completely lost his mind, lashing out and talking to himself the whole shtick. So this happened about two years ago, and it still gives me the chills when I think about it. Before I explain the story, it's important to understand the layout of the second floor of my home. When you walk up the stairs, the first room is a bathroom, and then it's my room, then my parents' room. So usually I wake up once a night to go to the bathroom, and my parents never notice since they sleep like actual babies. Nothing will wake them up other than the sunlight in the morning a really loud alarm or a light turned on on the second floor. 
So anyway, I wake up and go to the bathroom as usual. And to avoid waking them up, I do not turn on the light. The toilet is close to the opposite wall from the door. So you have a clear view of the door when you do your business. So I finished what I needed to do. And then I turn towards the door and oh God, there he is. Only visible by the moonlight. I saw a very tall man in a baby mask. Kind of like the mask Eleven wears in Stranger Things. I was so in shock that I didn't even scream. I just stared. And he stared back. After what felt like forever, he slowly puts his finger up to his mask and does a shush motion, tilted his head, and raised the knife as a threat. I felt like my heart dropped and I nodded. Then he took a step towards me and whispered, Don't let the bed bugs bite. And then left the bathroom. I heard him slowly walk downstairs, open the front door and shut it. I immediately checked out the bathroom window, which looks down on my street, to make sure he had actually gone outside and was not still inside. I saw him wave at me and then run off. I ran out of the bathroom and into my parents' room to wake them up, told them what happened and they called the police. They found him a couple hours later, completely high and with a couple of stolen items. He didn't steal anything from our house though. Anyway, every time I go to the bathroom at night now, I close the door, turn on the light, check the shower and do my business. This happened to me last spring. I live in a quiet and wealthy part of North London, and I attend a very academic, all-girls school in my neighborhood. Since my school is really academic, we were required to complete the Bronze Duke of Edinburgh. It's like a program that gives you extra credit in life, and it's part of the school curriculum. And as much as I didn't want to do it, I sort of had no choice in the matter. So, our school is divided into six buildings, four with only classrooms, a drama department, the music block, and the sixth form building, with a sports department on the first floor. I believe in America the sixth form are the junior and the senior years. The sports department also has a huge sports hall, a bunch of offices, and a rather small playing field. The playing field is at the very back of our school campus, and it's never really used much. Anyways, our first ever expedition for Duke of Edinburgh was coming up in a couple of weeks' time, and we all felt pretty confident about it. But since we were a useless bunch of teenagers, our teachers thought that it would be helpful for us to practice setting up and sleeping in the tents overnight. I didn't like the sound of that at all. It's just utterly creepy to stay in school overnight, especially on some little playing field at the far corner of the campus. But my parents signed my permission slip. What can I say? So the day the sleepover rolled around, we had a double PE lesson that afternoon during which we went down to the creepy playing field to practice setting up the tents so that that night wouldn't be totally chaotic. The most disturbing part about that field was that it faces an abandoned building. Even though it was separated by a stone wall, it still looked weird. It was one of the only abandoned houses in the neighborhood. The creepy house was ginormous, and it was made out of red brick. Anyways, we sat down in a semicircle while the teachers explained to us how to set up everything. I was sitting in between my best friend, let's call her Kate, and my close friend, let's call her Izzy. So Izzy was making an abnormal number of dirty jokes referring to the teacher's speech about setting up the tent. Not gonna lie, they sort of made it really easy for us. Izzy and I are sitting there laughing like two absolute idiots, while everyone else was listening in silence, until one of the teachers said they would give us detention if we didn't behave. We giggled a little more but eventually we settled down. It was now starting to get very boring. Our semicircle faced the abandoned building, so I couldn't help my eyes wandering there every few minutes. Eagerly, I was waiting for the talk to end, when something in the background caught my eye. It was a figure standing at one of the top story windows in the abandoned building. I couldn't see whether it was a man or a woman at the time, because my eyesight is bad. All I knew was that the person was wearing something really dark, like a hoodie or something. As I continued looking at the blurry silhouette for a while, it seemed like the shadow was staring directly at me. I started freaking out a little, so I nudged at Izzy and I said, OMG, look. First she looked at me, and then at the window that I pointed at. But when I looked up, right after Izzy, I saw the opaque curtains move a bit, but nobody was there anymore. I also told Kate about what had just happened, 
Obviously, neither of them believed me and started teasing me. I laughed it off, but I still felt a tad nervous. We then attempted setting up our tents, and our lesson came to an end. Fast forward to later that evening, and it was really weird seeing the school without any students in it, but as I was approaching the field, I saw Kate, so I felt a bit better. I was in the same tent as her because she was in my group for the expedition. We then later discussed all our teenage girl stuff as we tried to go to sleep. I often had trouble getting to sleep, even in my own bed. And as expected, I wasn't able to fall asleep easily in the tent, so I kept going through my phone until it was really late and I was sure that everyone was asleep, including Kate. I was starting to drift off around 2am, but then it started to rain. It was at that moment I understood that I should have been listening to the teacher's explanation of how to correctly put up a tent instead of Izzy's dirty jokes, because our tent was starting to fill up with water. I imagined that we probably hadn't zipped up the outer layer of the tent properly. So I gathered every bit of strength that I had left and I climbed outside, leaving my phone. I struggled for a while, but I ended up successfully zipping up the tent. By the time I had finished, I was soaking wet, so I decided to grab a dry hoodie from my PE kit. We stored our sports kits inside the PE department, which had been left open in case we needed the bathrooms. The halls were pitch black, so I was getting really creeped out. Anyways, I went into the changing room, switched the light on, and then changed into my dry hoodie. When I pushed down on the door handle in order to leave, for some reason it was stuck, and it wouldn't move. It felt as if someone was holding the handle on the other side. At this point, I started to freak out a little more. Me being the way I am, I asked quietly, Hello? No response. Now, even though I was quite scared, I could be savage and was also really strong. This time around, I asked in a very firm, clear voice, Is there anybody there? I'm not exactly sure what my logic was at the time. Like, did I actually think he was going to say, yeah, it's Peter. Do you want a sandwich? But again, there was no response. I started trying to wiggle the door handle free so hard that it actually came off in my hand, which I thought was extremely odd since the building was very newly built. That, and the person didn't have to hold the door anymore because I was stuck and I couldn't open the door even if I really tried. At this point, the lights went off in the changing room. Now, the situation seemed as if though it came out of a movie. But reality was catching up to me, as I understood that somebody really was on the other side of that door, because the light switch to the changing room was outside. To be honest, I was actually having a panic attack, so without thinking I started banging and kicking the door while screaming, HELP! at the top of my lungs, desperately hoping that a teacher or a security guard would hear me. But I think that only angered the other person, as I saw the part of the door where the handle was built onto slowly begin to turn. I immediately run to the other side of the changing room, it was like two meters away, and then I locked myself in one of the shower cells, which was the first place that I could think of. As soon as I locked the door behind me, I heard the door opening and heavy footsteps enter the room, which convinced me that it was a man. I tried to silence my breathing with my hand, but I don't think I did a very good job, as the footsteps soon stopped right before my shower cell. At first, I couldn't quite comprehend what he might be doing, but then I see an eye glaring at me through one of the gaps in between the door hinges. This was the most scared I'd ever been in my life. I screamed like there was no tomorrow. I was so lost because I didn't understand what I could possibly do to get out of here. But then it hit me. I was hoping I was strong enough to pull this off. I swung the door open so hard I slammed the man in the face. Now I knew the door was open because I didn't hear it closing. If he closed it he would be stuck too. So I run out of that room and down the hallway while screaming so loudly that my own ears started to ring. Now that building was about 20 meters away from the playing field. So I run as fast as I could while screaming at the top of my lungs which woke up the majority of people asleep in the tents. I had a panic attack and I couldn't breathe for a good 10 minutes. But later, I explained to the teachers what had happened. They ended up calling our version of 911, but the man was never found, probably because I'd given them plenty of time to escape. Everybody was sent home straight after that. However, 
I remember clear as day that as I was running away, I turned around and saw the figure in the dark hoodie that I had seen standing in that window earlier in the day. That night still haunts me, even as I write this out.